This video was voted on and supported by patrons such as Amanda Guth, Abby Knutson, Kinzel TN, and Gameplayer1500. Thank you. Here we are at one of the most divisive entries, Pack 6. If you're watching a review on Jackbox 6 and somehow don't know how this works, the TLDR is that the Jackbox Party Pack series are games everybody connects to with their phones and can support up to thousands of players at once when including the audience feature. Only one person needs to buy the game, and no need for any downloads beyond that. You just need to go to jackbox.tv on any device that has an internet browser. If you want a more in-depth explanation, go to my Jackbox playlist I have linked below where I've been reviewing every single game in the series in order of release. But enough formalities. Let's jump in with one of the best party pack inclusions ever, Trivia Murder Party 2. The original Trivia Murder Party, one of the best party pack games from Jackbox 3, sees a return in pack 6, and it's just as good, if not better, than the first. The sequel here, which supports up to 8 players and a much improved audience feature, which I'll get into later, once again sees you and your friends trapped in a murder hotel by your serial killer host, simply known as Redacted, who I gotta say, is much more audible in the sequel than he was in the original. The voice actor seems much more comfortable with the role, and he does a fantastic job here. The hotel business isn't all fun and murder. I've got overhead to worry about. Only one of you is making it out alive, and your best bet is to be good at trivia. Everybody gets asked a question, and all the players who get the question wrong get sent to the killing floor, a collection of minigames all holding the possibility of death. This is the duality of Trivia Murder Party that, in my opinion, makes it so great. If you're a huge trivia buff, you can make it through by getting trivia correct. Or if you're like me and suck ass at trivia, you can just narrowly get by if you're good enough at the minigames. Don't mistake it though, being forced to play minigames is definitely the punishment of getting trivia wrong since it's the only time you can die. In my opinion, the overall selection of games is a big improvement on the first Murder Party. Most of the original good ones are here, sans the Boggle one and the Pattern Recognition one. The latter often glitching out by not showing up on the devices of everyone playing, which I can only imagine is why it wasn't included here. But most of the newcomers are some of the best. The Plinko one sees players dropping a token onto a board trying to avoid death zones set by other players. This is a great one, especially when you got tons of people. Then you got that game based off that one magic trick of the assistant jumping inside a box that gets impaled, except in this scenario, you, assuming you got the trivia wrong, are the person jumping in that box. And the other players get to decide where in the box to stab. Hell, if exactly two people get the trivia wrong, one of the games that can appear is literally just a round of quiplash, which is absolutely hilarious. I mean, that alone should be enough to instate Trivia Murder Party 2 as the clear winner when comparing the Killing Room games. My absolute favorite new inclusion is that password minigame. Basically, you have to enter in a four-letter word, and all the other players have to guess what you entered. If a player guesses a word that has a letter in the same place as the victim's entered word, your screen will let you know so players aren't just blindly guessing. As you could guess, if anyone guesses the word before the time runs out, the victim dies. Really interesting idea for a Killing Floor game. Although, I'm sure the modern interpretation of this game is just... Holy sh**, guys, it's Wordle! Oh my god, I love Wordle! Once there is one living player remaining, everyone, including anyone who died, gets sent to the final round where you are bombarded with constant multiple choice questions. So if you got something like, States in India, you have to click on all that apply, which could be all, two, one, or none, depending on the question. For every correct selection, you move up one space. And the idea is you want to be the first to escape out the door at the end of the hallway. The living player gets to start halfway down the hall, but only gets to select from two answers, opposed to the dead players who get three, which makes the progress of the living player considerably slower. And if any of the players that died end up passing the living player, they steal their life and can win with it. Meaning that if you died early in the game, you can still totally win during the final round. So don't just yeet as soon as you die. Because all of the trivia leading up to that final round 100% matters. Since the more money you have from getting trivia correct, the higher up in the hallway you will start once the final round begins. New to the sequel is a new barrier feature, where you cannot win the game unless you get all three answers correct on the final question. Personally, I really like this feature, because it cranks up the suspense to 100. Having a bunch of players struggling at the barrier while insta-kill darkness gradually closes in on them is some pure adrenaline-filled entertainment. Couple that with the phenomenal sound design? Like, holy crap, it's so suspenseful. Much like the original Murder Party, the music builds as you get further down the hallway. And if you thought it was well done in the original, then get a load of this. First it's like... Then it's all. Then when the remaining players are all trying to break through a final barrier, it's like. <laughs> 
so damn good. Seriously, this might be the best sound design in any Jackbox game, period. How could you even top this? The ways in which they've improved the formula is outstanding. The presentation, both audio-wise and graphics-wise, feels higher budget. As I said, the overall killing floor game selection is better. The final round is more suspenseful. There are multiple endings. Yeah, so one of the killing floor games is just called Gifts, which will ask the players to open some gifts. But one of them per round will not only contain an item that will affect the way you or other players have to play, but will even have a secret ending depending on which item you escaped with. There's a handful of these items, ranging from a knife that makes you or other players cut off a finger so you can no longer select one of your trivia answers, to an item like Dad's hat, which forces the person wearing it to the killing floor even if they got the trivia right. And again, on top of that, all of these have unique endings if you win the game with the item in your possession. I love you, Dad. I forgive you. The audience feature is a huge step up. In the original, anyone who joined after the eight in-game players would be an audience member who could answer the trivia alongside the in-game players, but it really didn't amount to much. It was just for fun, really. I mean, you technically don't even need a phone if you just want to see if you got the trivia right. However, here in the sequel, everyone in the audience represents one collaborate player that can actually win the game. The audience works in a majority rules sort of way, aka the answer the audience player picks is contingent on what the majority of the audience voted. That's already pretty cool, but if you only have one player in the audience, it basically just plays like any other player would play. There can't be any sort of majority rule mentality if there's only one player, so anything the single audience player chooses is going to be what the audience player submits. Because of this, assuming you truly only have one player in the audience, this sort of works like a makeshift ninth player. You won't get to play any of the games in the killing floor, but the majority of the game is otherwise there. Trivia Murder Party 2 is suspenseful, it's paced well, there are tons of easter eggs, it does everything the original does, but better. And I can't wait to see how they top it. I want to show you something. Role Models. Who are you? That's the question Role Models aims to answer. Of the six players, which makes it one of those weird games that supports six people instead of eight for whatever reason, start off by choosing one of five categories. You'll want to pick a category that all the players know about. So if one of the categories is like Lisa Frank designs or something, and even one person is not familiar with that subject at all, probably, you know, shouldn't pick it. Reason being is that once a category is chosen, you need to click and drag every player, including yourself, into one of the roles you you think best matches them. Needless to say, these descriptors will be based on whatever subject you picked, and if you don't know the chosen category, you're probably not going to have a strong enough reference to know where to assign one of your friends. Once the votes are in, it goes roll by roll showing who everyone voted for. If you receive the most votes for a particular role, you are now assigned to that role. The roles you end up being assigned determine how the game describes you and your personality by the end. It's all very horoscopy in execution. It has absolutely nothing to do with who ends up winning, but it's a lot of fun to see how the game ends up categorizing you and your friends. If you do care about score in a game like this for whatever reason, you receive what the game calls science pellets, or you know, points, anytime your vote matches the winning vote for whichever player in role. So being a sheep and thinking like the rest of the group really does pay off. Well, at least for winning role models. You get additional science pellets anytime you double down on a vote via the 99% option. If you're absolutely certain one of your friends will be overwhelmingly voted for a certain role, you can use your 99% on that vote. You get one of these 99% per round, and there's no penalty for using it. So even if you're unsure for all of your votes, it's worth using it on someone. Anytime there's a tie between players for a role, the voting players will be asked another question retaining to the role in question. For example, there was a three-way tie in a game I had for the role Paradigm Shift. So the other players were asked which of us three would be most likely to shift the current paradigm. No two or more players can ever have the same role, so anytime that's a potential conflict, players need to settle it. Other conflicts that require further voting also include when a player has two potentially conflicting roles, or if two players got the same role from two different rounds. In the case of the conflicting roles, players decide which of the two roles is a better descriptor for the person in question. And for when two people have the same role, the other players are asked to vote for which person is more deserving of it. Winning votes and correctly assigning roles leads to more science pellets, and the person with the most science pellets by the end is the winner. Although for most of the games I played, nobody really cares about the scores. It's just fun to see what labels the game 
identifies you and your friends with by the end. As a minor note, the game does have an audience feature, although it's not much. Audience can decide which roles give out extra points, and break tiebreakers whenever players need to vote on who gets what role. Audience feature here is pretty shallow admittedly, but this isn't exactly the kind of game you're going to be streaming on something like Twitch anyway, since all the players need to know each other, so it's hardly a loss. No, role model seems to be specifically intended for close friends and family, and if you play with close friends or family, it's a good time. Whenever I visit my family, they enjoy this one a lot. Old friends from high school, they also dig it. Role models is sort of a weird inclusion because, honestly, I'd almost describe it as more of a toy than a game. In my opinion, it's a fun toy, one I've pulled out Jackbox 6 for on multiple occasions simply because somebody asked for it. But things make a lot less sense once you start analyzing it as a game that does in fact have a winner. For example, you're playing a game with the category Giant Monsters and one of the included roles was Cthulhu. If you vote a certain player as Cthulhu, and then they get caught up in a tiebreaker with someone else where they have to answer a question, even if you think the other person's answer is better, strategically, it makes the most sense to stick with the person you originally said was Cthulhu anyway because if you go against your own initial vote and vote for that other person instead, now whatever you said the other person was is automatically wrong because they just got assigned a role you initially said belonged to someone else. But obviously, critiques like that are only valid if you play the game under the mindset of I want to win. If instead of a game, you treat it like a party navigated personality test, which I do believe is the best way to approach it. Scores, winning, again, it doesn't matter. And it's best to ignore the scoring system altogether if you just want to see more accurate descriptors for you and all your friends. I've heard a lot of people rag on this game, and I do think that's where the distaste comes from. If you're not exactly a super sociable person, and want to play something that is a bit more of a game, role models probably won't be for you. It's one of my go-to party pack titles for me and many of my friend groups. But the things I've said are for sure something you should take into consideration in regards to what you and your friend groups like. I don't know if role models is really anything that deserves a sequel. I mean, after all, the only thing I would want to see is a higher player count. I mean, that and I guess a scoring system that doesn't favor voting biases. But when something like role models is brought out to be a talking piece opposed to, well, a game, at least in the traditional sense, all the shortcomings of the scoring system aren't really a big deal. For what it is, I'm really glad it's here. It's a cool inclusion I enjoy playing with my close friends and family, and it's something I'll definitely be playing again sometime in the near future. Wow, two for two. Let's ruin this streak of Joke Boat. Joke Boat is a fill in the blank game with a heavy emphasis on presentation. I guess a better way to describe it is that Joke Boat is a stand up comedy game. In fact, that's kind of the whole premise. The game sees up to eight players taking the role of amateurish ventriloquist comedians, as if there were any other kind, on a run down boat that serves the backing of your terrible comedy routines. It starts by asking you to enter the names of objects, places, people, etc. You then will be asked to choose a setup for a joke containing a fill in the blank. The options you have to fill in said blank will be one of the various things players entered earlier. Once you choose one, you finish the joke by typing whatever you want for the punchline. Everyone does this twice and then it's time to present your jokes. If you're some sort of deranged maniac that will play Jackbox in an all muted call, there's a button for the game to present for you, which literally just means the game will go, or you can choose to tell the joke yourself, which is what's encouraged given the premise and the fact that it's you know, Jackbox. Two players will tell their jokes back to back, and the other players, plus an audience of up to 10,000, vote on which joke they thought was funnier. Very reminiscent of Quiplash. After all the jokes have been told, you get to the final round where you are asked to rewrite someone else's joke into your own. You can choose between a joke that lost a round and a joke that won a round. If you rewrite a joke that won, all the points you receive will be worth double. The assumption, of course, being that it will be easier to rework a joke that didn't work into one that did, opposed to rewriting a joke that did work into something better. All the rewritten jokes are told, points are distributed, and the player with the highest score wins. There is not a whole lot to analyze here because the big thing that ruins Joke Boat is fairly obvious to anyone who's played it. That problem being, the system for writing jokes is just way too restrictive. You have to be a comedy legend to make some of these setups even remotely work. The standout example being a prompt that reads, how many blanks does it take to change a light bulb? Depending on your options, feeling in that blank of something that makes for a good setup to a how to change a light bulb joke is already a tall task. But then to twist your arm even further, they decided to throw in three, one to screw it in, and two to blank. Why the game decides to fill in half your punchline with this structure that is not at all flexible is beyond me. And that right there really highlights the problem of joke boats. I mean, what if the provided number three doesn't make sense for your chosen topic? Even if it does, what if it does 
doesn't make sense to start your punchline like that. I mean, the game is already directing your joke in a very specific way as is by providing the setup, so it also trying to direct your punchline is a restriction too far. Odds are you'll probably have a better idea of how your joke should play out than the game will, given it's a game and it doesn't have the full context. So backing the player into an awkward corner like this makes for a game where it feels like a challenge to make your submission even sound like a joke. Forget comedy. If your submission even reads as a joke, and not some Alzheimer's ramblings, then that in of itself is commendable. The idea of a stand-up comedy game is honestly a pretty good one, and it's one that is definitely suitable for a Jackbox inclusion. But for this idea to work, it just can't be this restrictive. Whereas a game like Quiplash feels like it's setting you up for a punchline, Jokebo is instead giving you obstacles you need to work around. This game is like trying to swim with bricks strapped to your feet. Like sure, you could do it, and it's impressive if you can, but the overall swim session would be better for everyone if they weren't there to begin with. In light of all of that, it's not like this game is a complete loss. The host and setup are likable. I mean, a run-down boat filled with failed comedians is pretty funny. The art and sound design, of course, is great. For what it's worth, I do like the final round, eh, conceptually at least. It's generally not much funnier than the first round. But I don't know, I like the idea of hearing someone else's joke and internally saying, aw oh, man, if I was telling that joke, I would have said blank. And then actually getting the chance to do just that. Of course, that rigid structure is still there, but honestly, not a bad idea for a final round. Unfortunately, Joke Boat isn't as good of a presentation game as Patently Stupid are the later talking points, and it's not as funny or quick as Quiplash. If for whatever reason you just want to know how painfully unfunny the group you're playing with is, this is a pretty good way to find out. Just know that this is one ship you're likely not going to want to sail again. Dictionary. This is another fill in the blank game. Yeah, Jackbox 6 technically has two of them. That sees players entering new made up words into a dictionary. Up to eight players and an audience, much like Joke Boat and of course Quiplash. Game starts by all the players receiving a word or phrase to which they need to provide a definition. You can take this seriously and write something believable, or treat it like Quiplash and give it a definition people will find funny, which I find is generally the more enjoyable way to play this. Everyone's suggested submissions are thrown up on the screen, and players vote for their favorite. Voting works similar to Quiplash in that the audience votes are worth just as much as the in-game player votes. Once a definition is decided, you're then asked to provide a synonym for the initial game submitted prompt. I presume so that way, you can enter a word that sounds more fitting to the player submitted definition. Players vote for their favorite synonym, and then move to the final round where you are asked to use the word in a sentence. Everyone's example sentences are thrown up on the screen, players make a final vote for their favorite, and the most voted definition, synonym, and example sentence are all entered to make up a single brand new dictionary entry. The cool thing about this is you actually have an in-game dictionary full of all the entries you made in past games, which can be a lot of fun to browse through. Or at least it would be if it showed you all your games. Instead of saving your games to your hard drive, it seems like it saves your games onto the Jackbox server. The downside to this is that Jackbox servers will only hold onto data for any particular game session for so long, meaning you only get to view dictionary submissions from your most recent games. That aside, the more votes your submissions get during any of the rounds, the more points you get, and there is a winner declared by the end to the person who got the highest score. Dictionarium is similar to role models in that it's almost more of a toy than a game. The overall structure definitely makes it feel more like a game than role models, but I make the comparison because most of the time players are more engaged in the dictionary entry being created than the overall winner. However, unlike role models, I don't think I've ever had anyone asked to play this party pack game specifically. Dictionarium isn't a bad game or anything. I mean, I've never met anyone who hated it, but I've also never really known anyone that considers it to be one of their favorites. Most people, myself included, are generally indifferent to it. It can be entertaining, it serves its purpose as a quick word entry game, but it doesn't really do much beyond that. Or mostly quick. Don't get me wrong, Dictionarium is an extremely short game. One of the shortest Jackbox games, in fact, only beaten by Wordspud in Lycewater in regards to length. But honestly, I think it could have been trimmed down even further. The main point of contention for me being the unnecessarily frequent scoreboard. Given the score only changes a total of three times, because you know, the whole game you only enter three things, showing the scoreboard between every round feels like padding. I mean, these are short rounds. No joke, the scoreboards and final results probably take up 10% of the game's runtime. The only other things to mention is one, the game game's pleasant presentation. I particularly like how the timer is represented by letters falling off a sentence. Really clever touch. And secondly, when you start a game, you're given the option between word game and slang phrase game. Both of these modes follow the same exact structure, however. The only difference is slang phrase game will use words that sound more explicit, I guess is the word I would use. So if 
you and your group prefer to play this more like a comedy game like Quiplash, Slang Phrase is probably the mode you want. Not sure why it doesn't just give you a description for these in-game, but in case you were wondering what the difference between the modes were, there you go. Dictionarium is a completely serviceable game, but it feels like something that is only going to get played by proxy whenever another game is asked for, and Jackbox 6 is already booted up. Push the button. Finally, we get to the big one. You have no idea how long I've been waiting to talk about this game. In my opinion, this is the most ambitious party pack inclusion, and there's a lot to talk about, so buckle up. Push the button. The only pack six game to have a 10 player cap opposed to the typical eight. Sees all the players aboard a spaceship, trying to find out which players are secretly aliens before the time runs out. The obvious comparison these days being Among Us, although Push the Button came out a couple of years before Among Us became relevant. To the point where most reviews of Pack 6 at the time of its release reference Mafia as a comparison instead of Among Us. When the game begins, you will either be assigned an alien that needs to blend in, or a human that needs to identify which players are aliens. This is done through various tests held on the ship. At the start of each round, one of the players is assigned Captain, who gets to pick one of four testing rooms, and which players to test in said room. You got the drawing quarters where you have to draw a picture to match your given prompt, writing pod where you type in an answer to the given question, opinion hold that provides a statement, and ask you to submit how strongly you agree or disagree, and finally, the deliberation deck that presents a situation in three lines of action you can choose to take. The catch with all of these is that the prompt the aliens receive will differ from the prompts a human will receive. So if you're doing drawing quarters, as a human you might get draw a supervillain, whereas an alien will get the prompt draw a mad scientist. The cool thing about push the button is that in a scenario like this, the mad scientist drawing seems so applicable to the prompt that whether or not the alien will get away with it is entirely based on how convincing of a liar they are. Or rather, how convincing of a liar they are not. That's not a robot, okay, Dave. We well, Shit. it's... No stars, baby. <laughs> He got <laughs> All of the testing rooms follow this human prompt alien prompt dynamic with the exception of the deliberation deck, which instead has aliens blindly guessing between their three presented responses. The differences between the rooms adds a lot of strategy to the game since they all have their own pros and cons. Something like the drawing quarters can be one of the more conclusive rooms. However, the downside is that waiting for everybody to draw a response can eat up a lot of time, whereas opinion hold and deliberation deck are much quicker, but also less helpful since all the responses are provided by the game opposed to the players. There is also a fifth room that is only available after five minutes have passed, the Bioscanner. The Bioscanner really breaks this game wide open because it will straight up tell you who is or is not an alien. I'd say we touch Silo Hawk. What? However, this comes with many caveats. First of which, you have to run a test to get access to it. The captain who selected the bioscanner has to pick two people to assist them with the test. From there, the captain has to explain the three symbols on their screen to their two assistants. And assistants need to select three symbols out of a list of them that hopefully match what the captain is describing to them. This whole process can be a huge gamble if any of the participants during this test have no idea what they're doing. I have a friend group I play this with so much we can successfully knock this test out another 30 seconds basically every single time. However, I've also played games of randos where it took them two minutes just to ultimately fail it. The people you choose to help you out with this test is super important, because it can mean the difference between wasting a huge portion of the clock and successfully riding out the alien. Either way, if the test does succeed, the captain of that round gets to choose any player to test. The game will then tell them, and only them, whether the person they tested was an alien or not. This opens up the game to a wide variety of scenarios. You would hope the captain is a human helping out their boys by relaying important information, but the captain for that round just as likely could have been an alien, and can lie that a human is an alien, or test another alien and lie that it's actually a human. I've even seen games where the alien was the captain, bioscanned another alien, and ratted them out as an alien to drive off suspicion from themselves. Because as long as at least one alien survives by the end, the aliens win. Or hell, forget the scan entirely, because an alien can purposely botch the test to prevent a human from gaining access to the scanner at all, which only drives even more suspicion. Did a player pick the wrong symbols just because they suck ass? Or is that person an alien trying to deny bioscanner intel? If all that wasn't enough, there is one last feature that truly makes push the button the deceptively comprehensive experience that it is. The hacks. Every alien has exactly two hacks they can use to hack any player, including themselves. 
Hacking a human will give that person an alien prompt for that round. And hacking an alien will give that alien a human prompt. Again, the number of scenarios this leads to is insane. Aliens can focus their efforts on a single human by hacking them the whole game, making that player look extremely suspicious. They can hack themselves to blend in, or not hack themselves at all, just lie that they were hacked. Knowing when to use your hacks is super important, because something the game doesn't tell you, and it would seem most people don't know, is that the longer the game goes on, the more extreme the differences between the alien and human prompts become. These differences can be as subtle as draw a bear to draw a cartoon bear, to as extreme as draw Pikachu to draw a magic raccoon during the late game. The dilemma this creates for aliens is that you might want to hold on to your hacks since they essentially become more powerful as the game progresses, but you also might want to use them right away to put early suspicion on a player or keep suspicion off yourself. There are always so many concurrent things happening in a single push to button game, it really makes makes every PlayStation feel uniquely its own. Once the timer starts getting close to zero, someone needs to <clears throat> push the button and make a final decision. The person who pushed the button has to choose which players to eject out to space. But keep in mind, you only get one shot of this. If there are two aliens, there will be exactly two slots open in the extraction room to put people into. So if even one of the players you eject was a human, aliens win. Once the captain decides on who to throw into the extraction room, the vote needs to be unanimous. If a single person disagrees that the selected players are the aliens, the button press is nullified and you go back to the room selection, at which point someone else will need to press their button since each player only has one button push. In the end, humans win by ejecting all the aliens, and aliens win if either the timer hits zero or if one or more remain on the ship after the ejection. That's push the button and as you can probably gather, it's a full scale game. There is so much here you could unironically sell it for 15 bucks or so. The amount of of content in this single inclusion makes a little more sense after hearing about the development for the game. Yeah, so Push the Button, I believe, had the longest development cycle out of any party pack game. At the very least, it was originally intended to be in pack 4. Apparently, the game went through so many different phases and had so much testing. Employees around the Jackbox office got sick of playtesting it towards the end of the game's development. But personally, I'd argue it was worth it. Because I mean, just look at this. The production value for this game is just insane. And not just in terms of mechanics, but in terms of presentation too. At the time of this review, this is still the only Jackbox game to primarily use 3D environments and character models, opposed to the 2D stuff that party packs are generally known for. I mean, unless you count Trivia Murder Party, I guess. Although the characters in Trivia Murder Party aren't rigged for animation in the same way that they are in Push a Button. Either way, it looks and sounds fantastic. All of it. I seriously commend anyone who worked on this. Let's address the elephant in the room though. especially given the space theming, it's practically expected this will be compared to Among Us. Whether or not you like or prefer Push to Button is going to depend on what elements you value in Among Us. If you're one of those assholes that joins a game of Among Us and then leaves the second you're not the imposter, yeah, this game probably won't appeal to you. But if you enjoy playing the role of detective and piecing together bits of information in an attempt to unravel the whole picture as it plays out, then you'll probably like Push. In fact, I think it does that element way better than Among Us, and it's why I prefer Push the button. Way too many games in Among Us just regress into a game of he said, she said. I cannot even tell you how many times I've seen Among Us games end with three people, two of them yelling down the other's throat saying they're the imposter, and that third guy just sitting there with absolutely zero information being forced to make a baseless 50-50 shot in the dark as to who's telling the truth. I'm telling you, Toast, it's Charlie. He, I was with Toast the majority of the last round as well. <laughs> This is actually not that easy for me. The two smart design choices to prevent push games from descending into a total guessing game is one, all players always have access to all the same information at any given time. Literally at any point in the game where you are not currently being tested, you can click on any player to see a list of everything they submitted during test, really playing into that feeling of taking the role of detective, trying to piece together all the clues. And two, nobody gets thrown out until the very end. In Among Us, if there is literally any sort of suspicion towards anyone, they just get thrown out. But since nobody gets thrown out until the very end of push, there is a lot more deliberation that goes on up until that point. Someone you originally had suspicion on may end up seeming completely legit a couple of tests later, and someone that might have seemed trustworthy early on might start showing some cracks as you reach the climax of the game. It relies on much less knee-jerk reactions than Among Us, which ends up creating a more analytical experience. Undeniably, however, push the button is 
is not as accessible as Among Us. There's a lot more mind games and mechanics going on in your average game of push, but that comes at the cost of, no pun intended, alienating certain types of players. Learning the game and how it works is a huge commitment that not everybody is going to be willing to make. It definitely stands out in a series full of games you typically just pick up and immediately understand. Whether or not you like the game is really going to boil down to if this is the type of experience you enjoy. Because otherwise, if you do like games like Mafia or Werewolves, I think Push the Button, for what it's trying to do, is perfectly executed. The only critique I've ever heard is that there's too much downtime waiting for other people to do tests. But I'm gonna counter that by saying the game's pacing is entirely dictated by the group playing. At any point, any player can click on the speed up button on the bottom left to hurry up the process of any room. Hell, you can even speed up the timer if someone is simply taking too long to pick a room. In fact, if all the players hit the speed up button, the timer is ignored completely and the game will immediately just jump to the next round. So if things are taking too long or you suspect someone is wasting time, don't be afraid to hit that speed up button. That's what it's there for. Even without that feature, however, you can, again, look through people's tests at any time you're not the person being tested. Whenever there's quote unquote downtime, that is time you should be spending looking through previous test results or talking to other players. Push the button really is a fully featured experience. It's suspenseful, engaging, it's impressively produced, one of my all-time favorite party pack inclusions. The only two suggestions I would think to give to improve the experience is one, maybe add an in-game notepad. Whenever I play push the button, I actually keep one for myself. Because while the game will tell you the results of anything that happened in-game, things people say during the game can be huge hints as to who's the alien. And in a game where you basically play detective, it can be helpful to organize your thoughts. The bigger suggestion, however, is this game desperately needs toggleable settings. The number of aliens, number of hacks, the number of concurrent players you can test at any time, and the time limit itself is all determined by how many people are in the lobby. And some of the predetermined settings are super questionable. If you're playing of seven players, you have two aliens, three people you can test per room, and 18 minutes to figure it all out. Then you bump that up to eight players. Now you have three aliens, but you can still only test three people at once and still only have have 18 minutes. Through my many, many hours of playing this game, I don't think I've ever seen humans win an 8-player game. I mean, nearly half the lobby is aliens, and only three people could be tested at a time? Like, seriously, what the hell? How were these the settings they decided on? If we ever get a push a button 2, which I would love to see, customizable settings would be my biggest request. As is, the game is still fantastic. It's not a game for everyone, but if this is the type of game you enjoy, then definitely give push the button to try, because it's seriously one of the best. And that's pack 6. I'm just gonna come out and say, Jackbox Party Pack 6 is my absolute favorite party pack. Although, ironically, it's one of the last I would recommend to newcomers of the series. First of all, this is the only party pack without a dedicated drawing game. There are drawing elements in Trivia Mario Party and Push the Button, but no games centered around drawing, which unfortunately highlights a bigger problem with pack 6. It's just a bit lopsided. Most of the games here lack the broad appeal of something like Quiplash, which leads to a much more niche following for this pack overall. Trivia Murder Party 2, Role Models, and Push the Button are three games that seem to appeal to three completely different friend groups. My friends that like Murder Party don't like Role Models, my friends that like Role Models don't like Push the Button, my friends that like Push the Button don't like Murder Party, and nobody likes Joke Boat. If anything, that just goes to show how experimental of a package Jackbox 6 really is. It is my most played party pack at over 100 hours between the Switch and Steam versions. Trivia Murder Party 2, Role Models, and Push the Button are of very high quality. In pack 6 is been pulled out multiple times just from one of those three games getting specifically asked for. Unfortunately, the other two games, Dictionarium and Joke Boat, feel like throwaways by comparison. I don't think I've ever had anyone asked to pull the pack out specifically for Dictionarium, and the one time Joke Boat was asked for got immediately regretted by said person within five minutes. The following entry, Pack 7, is good because they play it safe. Delivering games the team probably knew well in advance would get positive reception. I mean, 7's opening game is Quiplash 3. Doesn't get any safe than that. Jackbox 6, on the other hand, I like for the exact opposite reason. It takes a lot of risk, and while I would obviously rather play Quiplash over Jokebo any day of the week, I have huge respect for the team for trying to branch out like this. And many of their risks, such as role models and especially push the button, do pay off, at least for my friend groups. I'm giving the Jackbox Party Pack 6 a 4.4 out of 5. I wouldn't recommend this pack as anyone's first Jackbox, although I would say it's a nice compliment to Packs 3 or 7 especially. 
since it scratches a lot of itches, those entries do not. While divisive, Jackbox 6 is still my all-time favorite collection they put out. If any of these games sound like your cup of tea, then this is an easy pack recommendation. And I know I'll be booting it up many times after this review. Damn, I'm sorry for how long this took to make. Been really busy getting ready to move. In fact, what I'm recording right now will be the last bit of audio I record in this house ever. Either way, I'd like to give special thanks to patrons such as David Pacheco, Rami Batter, Abby Knutson, Amanda Guth, Awesome Games, Colin Vidar, David Marquezzi, Drew Kellenberger, Gameplayer1500, Jeffrey P. Long, Kenzel TN, and Pretoria Mars. Again, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, have a good one.